morning, everyone. So thanks for, for being here today after the, the long, long day uh, yesterday. Uh, so today I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about signal processing and uh, machine learning on graphs. You've seen already some talks uh, related to that uh, uh, yesterday by uh, Nubisa and also the students presented quite some work on, on, on that stuff. So I'll take a, like a little step back and, and present you kind of the, the basics. So we'll start with kind of a graph signal processing 101, you could say. And, and maybe you, you know some of these things, maybe, maybe it, it became so, so common to you that you forgot actually uh, some of the basics or why we, we call uh, certain things the way we call them. So I just want to take it a step back and, and give you an overview of that. Um, okay, so this is uh, kind of, this work is, is uh, uh, coming from collaboration with a lot of uh, people from our group, but also external collaborators. And I want to also especially thank uh, Alvin Sufi, Mario Coutinho, and Alberto Natali, who's also here today for helping me out with the, the, the slides. Okay, so let me start with why, why do we need machine learning or signal processing on, on graphs, right? So we know that classical uh, signal processing usually deals uh, with kind of very regular signals and it works in the, in the Euclidean domain. So we work with audio signals, uh, we, we process those, or, or images or, or uh, combinations, so then we have kind of uh, video, video uh, signals. But that domain is very regular, right? We have some kind of notions of proximity there. So in, in an image, you can talk about uh, top, bottom, left, right, uh, in, in, in uh, the temporal domain, right? So we, we know what is the, the past, the, the, the future, and, and so on. So it's a very regular uh, domain. But more and more data these days comes from, from networks uh, that, when, that we can characterize by means of a graph. So that has kind of a very irregular structure. And you can think about uh, you know, explicit networks like a transportation network here, the, the Minnesota road network that you saw also yesterday. You can also see the brain network as kind of an explicit network. If we look at, for instance, the anatomical brain network, the actual structural brain network where the edges then between different zones of the brain are actual connections, right, anatomically. A sensor network can also be kind of viewed as an as a explicit network if we, if we design the edges based on, on proximity. But there are also implicit networks where the edges are more, let's say, abstract. So like in a social network where edges represent uh, friendship, uh, relationships, for instance. Uh, but a brain network can also be viewed as an implicit network. Uh, and then we, we often call it a functional brain network. Then, then, then the edges within the zones in the brain are related to yeah, similar uh, activity that is going on. And they are not necessarily anatomically connected in that case. Also, sensor networks can be viewed not as an explicit, but, but as an implicit network, when also, again, the edges will be defined based on similarity of the, of the measurements there. So you always have to yeah, kind of uh, see what kind of networks uh, you are dealing with. And then the data itself, right? So I, I said we have more and more network data. Well, the data then can be viewed as kind of signals on top of these, uh, these graphs. So the graph is kind of your new domain. Instead of the Euclidean domain, now the graph is your, your domain, right? And then uh, with sensor networks, right, you can think of uh, yeah, every node measures some kind of uh, uh, temperature over, over time. Or in the road network, you can have, for instance, at the crossings, you can uh, measure the number of cars that, that are passing. Or in the brain network, uh, could be a functional MRI time series or opinion profiles in a, in a social network. And you already see here that actually the, sig the, the signals or the data on these nodes are, are kind, of, kind of temporal signals. Right? So you see there's actually already here two domains uh, playing a role. So you have the, the graph domain, but also the temporal domain. That's why later on in, the, in this first part, we will also talk about graph, graph time uh, signal processing. So to combine those two uh, domains. But okay, we will uh, see that later on. And then what is graph signal processing or graph machine learning in general if you, if you want? So, so in that case, given this graph now and these graph signals, we try to perform some, some inference task right, on, on this graph signal, but taking as prior knowledge the, the, the graph. So we take the knowledge of the graph into account when we do the processing. And that kind of differentiates, you could say, signal processing uh, or graph signal processing or graph machine learning from the more traditional uh, signal processing. So we have now this prior knowledge that we kind of exploit. So this is at least what, what I consider here as graph signal processing. There's also a whole field uh, 
of graph signal processing where they try to estimate the, the graphs from, from data. And it's something that uh, Gonzalo Mateos will talk about uh, tomorrow. But today, uh, this is my, let's say, definition. So the graph is given to us. And it's usually given by, yeah, some, let's say, uh, some, some other domain. In the road network, for instance, the graph is clear. In a social network, okay, you can derive it from, uh, let's say, friendship relationships. So, so you have, let's say, a Facebook network or something like that. Or you have the anatomical brain graph, which is also well known. So, so we assume that this knowledge is, is available somehow. And then the inference task could be many different things, right? In a sensor network, you can think about detecting uh, faulty sensors or doing even uh, distributed uh, processing. We will actually see that as an example in the, in the second part. In a traffic network, you can use it to predict traffic, uh, recommend routes, and, and so on. Or a social network, detecting fake news, recommend uh, recommendations. Um, in, in brain networks, uh, you can uh, use it for detecting uh, early stage Alzheimer and, and so on. So there's many types of inference, inference tasks. Could be kind of uh, regression, estimation, could be classification, uh, detection, you, you name it. So it's a, let's say in that sense, a very broad scope. But, but the, the, the main thing is that you have this kind of prior knowledge of the, of the graph. And if we want to do this inference, okay, we have now this prior knowledge, so we, we kind of need new tools, right? And, and we, that, that kind of exploit the structure of the graph. And we, and we know that in classical signal processing, the, the, the main tool, uh, and, and also in machine learning, are, are filters, right? So here you see kind of some pictures of a classical FIR and, and IR filter. And they have, they have kind of nice properties, right? We know that in, in, from classical uh, signal processing and machine learning, they have kind of theoretical guarantees. They have nice links with, with spectral responses. They have usually uh, a small number of uh, parameters. They kind of can embed this kind of data structure, this kind of proximity structure that I talked about in, in the Euclidean domain. They kind of take that into account. And then also in general, in, in let's say neural networks and so on, they reduce the number of parameters that you, that you have to learn and, and also lead to efficient implementation. So we are, we're looking for something like filters, right? Uh, but then in, the, in, in, let's say, with the graph structure taken into account taken into account. So that's basically what, we, what will be the main focus. And then we will apply right, these filters to, to different kind of um, uh, topics like uh, distributed optimization and machine learning. So that's kind of the, let's say, an introduction. So now I will go a little bit more uh, deeper into some details. So in, in part one, so before the break, I will kind of give a, a short give kind of an introduction, let's say, into graph signal processing. What are graphs, graph signals? What is a graph spectrum? How do we define variability and, and so on? And then also introduce these kind of graph filters, right? So what, what are filters in this, in this domain? And then also look at this extension, as I, as I mentioned, uh, where we try to combine the, the graph domain and the time domain. And then in the second part, uh, we will kind of apply these filters for distributed optimization and, and machine learning. Right, so for part one is kind of, uh, you could say, graph signal processing uh, 101 more or less. So I'll start with kind of the basics. And the main thing there is probably the signal variability and how this leads to a graph Fourier transform. And also how we can then see the time domain as a graph. And then we will go into uh, some graph filter uh, definitions and, and designs and implementations. And then extend this to graph time uh, signal processing. Right, so as I, as I said, so, so we have data sets with, with an irregular support and we can represent them by means of a graph. So we will uh, use G for graph, V is the set of nodes, E is the set of edges. So capital M will always be used throughout the whole talk for number of nodes. Capital M, if you see that somewhere, it's the, the number of edges. And we know that the adjacency matrix is usually how we represent, let's say, the, the different edges. And as you can already see here in this, in this picture, we can have uh, directed edges with arrows or undirected, and, and the thickness here of the lines, uh, I use that to indicate, let's say, the weights. And we usually use here a positive weights. And we have also consider the neighborhood. So NI will be neighborhood of node I. Uh, if we have directed graphs, this will be always considered as the, the inward neighborhood. So we only consider the nodes that are pointing towards the, the node I. So just to give a few examples, so for instance, if we look at the edge from uh, eight to seven, so it's kind of a thick line, so we have a large weight. This will be in the position seven, eight of the adjacency matrix. Uh, 
So note that, that the, where we start is actually the column index and where we end is the row index. Uh, mathematicians sometimes define it differently. And the other entry, because it's directed, so it will be zero. So it's, we don't have a, a symmetry there. And then also only the pair H7 will be part of the H7. And here you have an undirected graph, right, where we have then have the two entries in the adjacency matrix that will be uh, equal to each other. And then also these two pairs will be part of the H7. So that's kind of our definition. And in terms of neighborhoods, so if we look at the neighbors of node 2, so we have an undirected edge to node 1, to node 3, so those are in the neighborhood. And also 4 is pointing towards node 2, so that's also in the neighborhood set. Uh, for node 8, right, it's going away from 7, so 7 is not in the neighborhood of 8, but we only have 4 and 9 in that neighborhood. Because 4 is also pointing towards 8. So these are kind of some definitions uh, that we... Uh, introduced at the, at the beginning here. Okay. And then as we said, so we have a graph signal. So this is, let's say, uh, signals on top of the nodes. And although this could be time series, for now we consider a single scalar value that we have per node. And we can stack them into a vector x1 up to xn. And we can order them any way we want, as long as the ordering in the vector is the same as the ordering that we had in the adjacency matrix. So we have to make sure that these two are, are more or less the, the same, or, or exactly the same, actually. Yeah, by the way, feel free, if something is not clear, feel free to interrupt me, right? So, so that at least uh, everybody is, uh, uh, is aware of, of what I'm talking about and can follow the rest of the, of the talk. Yes? So here the weights, uh, the thick lines and the thin lines, uh, what is the underlying assumption? Uh, does it mean that the contributions, uh, say, uh, to node 7 are linearly combined with these weights? Is that the assumption? Uh, no, no. These are just, uh, let's say, you could say this is a road network and these are one-directional roads and the thickness is kind of the capacity. I think about something like that. So, so far there's no combining, right? I'm not applying this to any signal yet. And so we just have edge weights, which could be the, the capacity of these links or in a, in a water network. So we'll be defining uh, uh, the weights mathematically later? Uh, no, we keep it kind of abstract. So, so yeah, it depends on the application, right? So uh, in the examples, of course, we will, we will see some kind of uh, examples where we then set, set the weights. Uh, so in a sensor network, uh, we saw yesterday also examples where this could be related to the distance uh, in an exponential way or something like that. Right? Thanks. But yeah, it's important, of course. So, uh, so this knowledge will determine what will be the outcome of your graph filters and, and of your, your processes. So. Okay, so here you see, for instance, right? So as I said, the adjacency matrix is your basic representation here. It's very simple. It's like an unweighted, undirected. So we only have zeros and ones in there. And uh, so that it's a perfect uh, symmetric matrix here because it's, it's undirected. What's also that interesting to see is suppose that we take this adjacency matrix and we look at the square of the adjacency matrix, right? Because later on we will use powers of adjacency matrices or, or more general representations of the graph. And these powers actually then, uh, they will indicate kind of paths between, between nodes. If we take look at the, the, the power two of the adjacency matrix, that will indicate, let's say, paths of, of uh, two hops, right? So if we see number two here, in the squared adjacency matrix between the, for node two and node three, it means that there are two paths with two hops, right? And you can see them in green here. So indeed, two and three are connected by two paths with, with two hops. Mm -hmm. And four and five, actually, they, they have an entry zero. So because indeed, there's no path of two hops that connects these two nodes. So it's kind of, you look at, let's say, the two hop neighborhoods, right? By, by looking at, at A squared and, and so on. And so you can extend this to a to the power three. So then you will, the entries will determine the number of paths uh, of length three that you have between these nodes. But as I said, so instead of undirected, unweighted, you can have directed and weighted. So I already showed that in the, in the initial one. Uh, and so what they represent, yeah, that depends a bit on the, on the application. Uh, we also consider very often this degree matrix, right, which is uh, Nothing else than the kind of the, the superposition of the weights over the rows. So for, for uh, node 8, we kind of uh, 
superimpose all the weights in the adjacency matrix over row A. Why do it over rows, not columns? Because we, we consider a superposition over the, the nodes that are pointing towards, uh, towards the node of interest. Of course, here it's an example with an undirected graph, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But you see for node 8, then you see kind of it has uh, seven neighbors, so the, the entry in the degree matrix will be, will be seven. And then you know that this Laplacian matrix is also of interest in, in many applications. We will see some interesting properties later on. That is usually considered for undirected graphs. In, in principle, the, di the, the degree matrix and the adjacency also exist for, for directed graphs, but when we take the difference of the two, then usually we consider them for undirected graphs. Uh, so that, that typically looks like this. So then we get these negative entries here on the off diagonals, right? So it's usually a diagonally dominant, or it is a, by definition a diagonally dominant matrix, of course. And it's also positive semi-definite, which will be useful later on. So we have all these different matrices that can represent uh, a graph. Uh, so it can be the adjacency, can be the Laplacian. Uh, Ubisa also yesterday talked about another interesting representation. So I'm, I'm looking forward to read that paper on the doubly stochastic representation. So there's all kinds of interesting graph shift operators that you could consider. And again, what you exactly take will, will kind of determine your outcome. And it's not always clear what is the best one to pick. Uh, but OK, we will kind of make abstraction of that here. We will talk about the graph shift operator S that just represents the structure. And it can be any matrix. We just assume that it's kind of sparse. It has kind of the same sparsity pattern as the, the graph. Uh, on the diagonal, we can have zeros or, or not, depending a bit on the, on the representation that we consider. And next to adjacency, Laplacian, also popular ones, are this kind of normal, normalized adjacency. Here we consider it not normalized with the degree matrix, but with the maximum uh, eigenvalue, which is kind of the eigenvalue that's not necessarily maximum, but it has the maximum absolute value. And then this is the normalized Laplacian. Sometimes this, this part is also called normalized adjacency, but in this talk, we will consider it just the division by the maximum eigenvalue. You also have the random walk of Russian and, and so on. OK, so, that, so then another interesting uh, property is this diffusion. Also, Ubisoft talked about that uh, yesterday, so, uh, which is related to this uh, kind of graph signal shifting. So what happens basically when we multiply a signal with this graph shift operator? Uh, for instance, consider an undirected graph where we consider then the Laplacian as the graph shift operator and an all one signal. And if we then do the multiplication, you actually see that you don't really diffuse the signal over the graph with, related to the edge weights, but it's more like you're diffusing the difference of the signal over the edges and, and you weigh that one with the related uh, uh, with the edge weights. Right? So it's more like a diffusion, you could say, of the, of the difference over, over the edges. But we still call this kind of a diffusion of the signal, but with the Laplacian. And it's clear, of course, if we do this for an all one signal, since we have here the differences will be all zero, so that we get a zero actually for, for every node, uh, but also for, for node uh, two, which is here kind of worked out. For a directed graph, where we consider, for instance, the adjacency matrix and the all one matrix, there the, the signal diffusion will actually, let's say, diffuse the signal and take a linear combination of the signals on the different nodes with the related uh, edge weights. So there, if you have an all one signal for, for the same graph, but now directed, so here we have actually a directed edge from one to two, so only one is a neighbor of two, so then the signal on node two will become point two after the diffusion. And throughout the talk, we will very often, when we consider undirected graphs, consider the Laplacian, although you could also, for undirected graphs, consider the adjacency. But usually there, uh, since there's a lot, large body of work also using the Laplacian there, we will often consider Laplacian. And then for, for directed graphs, we will often consider the adjacency matrix, just to see how things differ uh, among these two uh, viewpoints. And of course, yeah, you could consider that modifications of either Laplacian or adjacency matrix. Is that all clear so far? So then signal variability, so that's now, now interesting. So uh, how do we define now how much a signal varies over, over the graph? Because that could then be interesting to kind of decompose our signal into uh, multiple uh, components with different, potentially different uh, variabilities. 
So again, let's take a look at first at an undirected graph with the, the, the graph shift operator Laplacian. Um, so then we can uh, think, for instance, about uh, counting sign changes. So that could be a good indication of variability, right? So we have, uh, let's say, so with count changes, I mean how many edges are there where the signal changes signs, right? So here you see that over the edge one, two, the sign is, is different, and two, three, the sign changes, and three, four, the sign changes. So we have three sign changes there. And here we have uh, four uh, sign changes. So, so we see, we, and, and you clearly see that somehow in that case, yeah, you see over the edges more variability. But it's, it's of course not very mathematical, right? And it's hard to describe uh, uh, mathematically, although it is, it is possible. But a more commonly, let's say, tool to, to look at variability in that case is to, to consider this kind of graph uh, Laplacian quadratic form, where you take uh, this kind of x transpose times Laplacian times the, the signal itself, and you work it out, then you see that what you do is actually you weigh the difference of your signal over the edges, the difference squared actually with the edge weights. Right? So if you have over, over edge weights, if you have over edges, if you have large difference between signals, on, the, on these edges, then you will have a large value there for this uh, graph Laplacian uh, quadratic form, right? and which kind of indicates then that we have a high variability. Right? So for the same signals again, uh, you, can, you can actually show that, that the graph Laplacian quadratic form will increase, right? because over these edges here, we will have a big difference, uh, if, and, and, so, and we weigh that with the, with the corresponding uh, edge weight, so it will uh, boost the, this uh, quadratic form. So the larger this quadratic form, the, the, the higher the variability. So we have a notion of variability in that case for undirected graph, which is a graph which is usually indicated then by this quadratic form. But OK, for, for directed graphs, we don't have a Laplacian. Right? We have an adjacency matrix there. Um, so how do we design then? How do we define then signal variability for these uh, for directed graphs? Well, there the, the notion that is usually considered is, is total variation. So basically the idea is that you consider your signal and you shift it over the graph and then you see how much it changed. Right? So you look at the difference between the original signal and kind of the shifted signal. But for practical reasons, because you don't want to blow up the, the energy, we consider the normalized adjacency there, right? So, so to kind of normalize the energy of that shifted signal. And you can kind of understand already that, that okay, if the signal is kind of constant and over the edges, and if there's not too many changes over the edges, that it will kind of remain similar. And we will usually people consider the L1 norm there, although you could also consider the L2 norm. Uh, that's a bit up, up to you. And you see here what, what happens when you do this, this shift. So although uh, this looks like a DC, you see that, that there is a difference, right? It doesn't remain the same. So it's not that the total variation of this L1 signal is equal to zero. So that's not the case here, but, but you see that it's kind of constant. It's not super varying, right? So the difference will not be, be huge. But the idea here is, again, so total variation large, then we have high variability. If it's small, we have a, a, a low variability. So that's usually considered in these directed graphs. So we have notions of signal variability in these uh, for directed graphs and, and undirected graphs. Yes? And it's lambda marks just the maximum high value L. Right? No, of, of the shift operator, so in this case, A, yeah, of A. Okay. Just to normalize the energy. Yeah. Yeah, and, okay, and one question also about the previous slide. Is it actually a single sum or a double sum? Like, because for the undirected edges, you can also, you can, you, it's you a sum, sum yeah, it's a sum over the edges, so yeah, it's a sum over the, uh, all the, so yeah, it's a double sum, yes. So, but of course, it only activates the, the, the non-zero edge weights, right? So, and of course, if it's, uh, yeah, so in, in, since it's symmetric, it will include the two, uh, the two terms there, but okay, uh, I could, so we get like, because AIJ is equal to AJI, so indeed, they will be twice there, but. Uh, you count them twice. Yeah, but, yeah, so that, mo that holds for all the edges, so then we get just a factor two there. That you could say, okay, I, 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 I drop it. So. That doesn't change the, the ordering. Right. So, and, and since we have signal variability, now we can think about, okay, can we define then based on the signal variability some type of 
uh, frequency modes that we can decompose our signal in. So we can actually decompose it into different signals that have different variability. Right? And, and it turns out that we can. And, and we will show later on um, why the eigenvalue decomposition of, of your graph shift operator actually leads to a, a good uh, set of, of these uh, graph modes. But okay, for now, just believe me that if we take this eigen decomposition of the graph shift operator under the condition that it exists, then we can, we can view these, these eigenvalues here as some kind of graph frequencies, or, or we can at least uh, derive the variability based on these graph frequencies. And the rows of the inverse uh, eigenvector matrix are actually the graph modes. Because, okay, many people often say, ah, the eigenvectors are actually the graph modes of my graph signal. Of my uh, of my graph, but that's actually not true, right? So it's true for directed graphs, uh, undirected graphs, because then this is kind of v remission or v transpose. But for for directed graphs, this is actually not true. So it's actually really the rows of the inverse eigenvector matrix, which are the the, the graph modes. And of course, if you believe me that these are good graph modes to consider, and they they have a, a certain variability different variabilities, then if we want to decompose then our signal according to these graph modes, then we just uh, kind of project them right on, onto these different rows. So we multiply the signal with this inverse uh, eigenvector matrix. And we then get x hat. So the hat here is usually is used for the frequency domain throughout the, the presentation. And then of course you have also the inverse graph Fourier transform. So that is then how, how the graph Fourier transform is defined. But okay, you always see this and then you think, yeah, okay, I, I accept it, but is this now is this, is this a good set of graph modes? I mean, do they have different variability and how do we kind of order them? Um, so what is, what is, which one of these guys is, is let's say, uh, has a low frequency or a high frequency? Yeah, the eigen decomposition of the... Excuse me. Is it the eigen decomposition of the graph shift operator that was chosen? Yes, so it could be Laplacian, could be adjacent C, right? So we will again go uh, in the next slides, we will see how, how this differs, right? And you chose in the beginning the operator, or yes. you can pick a number of them? Uh, yeah, like I said, it depends a bit on the application, and even for, for a specific application, yeah, there's no... Uh, it, I mean, you have to do it and then see which one works better. So there's no, uh, let's say, agreement on which one is better for which applications. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Is there any significance in the word modes? What does it mean, graph modes? Uh, yeah, it's like eigen, yeah, okay, you can already see that these are eigen modes, right, of the graph. Uh, so that's why we call them here also kind of modes, but they are frequency modes, I would say, so they're called graph modes, but they're related to different frequencies. Uh, so it's like you have these modal decompositions, right, where you, uh, but okay, here there, the modes are related to different frequencies. Okay, thank you. Maybe there's a, yeah, I should use another word, I don't know, maybe modes is considered like in, in other fields, like meaning, somewhere else, uh, meaning some, something else. Anyway, so that's kind of the question now, how do we kind of, first of all, yeah, uh, order them and, and measure their variability. But okay, we, we actually know how to do this now, we, we just saw that. So let's take a look at if we, if we consider this undirected graph, right? So one of the questions is what, what do we take? Okay, let's consider undirected graph and the graph shift operator then as the Laplacian. So in that case, of course, uh, we know that it's symmetric. Uh, it's also positive semi-definite. So we have, in that case, a decomposition that looks like this. So the V inverse becomes like a V transpose, and all the, the eigenvalues uh, are uh, also uh, real valued and, and positive. And actually, the first one is 0, because it corresponds to the all one, uh, the all one vector, which is one of the eigenvectors. So this is kind of well known. And then the question is, okay, now, yeah, so why are we calling these guys here graph frequencies and, and the, the, eigen, the eigenvectors, so these uh, uh, frequency vectors of the, of the graph? Well, we, we can measure their variability, right? So we, we just introduced this Laplacian quadratic form. So let's just plug in these, these eigenvectors of the Laplacian there. And then it's kind of obvious, right, if we put an eigenvector in this, in this quadratic form that we get the eigenvalue back. Right? So indeed, uh, if, we order, if we order the different uh, graph modes according to this kind of increasing uh, eigenvalues, then, then we kind of order them according to variability. Right? So the eigenvectors with the smallest eigenvalues, they will be uh, low frequency. 
and you, and you see that here, right? So this is the whole DC, so that will be exactly zero as your graph frequency, and, and you, can, uh, you can see that when the, when the signal becomes more and more variable, then uh, we get uh, a larger uh, graphing form. So this is the way how we should order the, the, the graph models. And that's why kind of this eigen decomposition yeah, gives us actually, based on the, on the Laplacian quadratic form, in that case, it gives us a good uh, uh, set of uh, graph modes or frequency modes. What about this directed graph? So th th then it becomes a little bit more tricky, right? So we have now, as a graph shift operator, yeah, we cannot take the Laplacian, so we take the adjacency matrix, it's non symmetric. So eigenvalue decomposition, yeah, in that case, might not exist, right? Eigenvectors and eigenvalues are also complex valued now. And as I mentioned, in this case, the eigenvectors themselves are, are not the, 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 the modes, the frequency modes. It's actually the, what, it's actually the rows of the, the V inverse matrix that are the, the frequency modes. Um, but then, then, okay, how do we order them now, right? So do we, do we order then the, the, the eigenvectors according to, to the amplitude of these, of these eigenvalues? Do, do they have something to do with the, with the graph frequency uh, or with the actual variability? Because they are complex values, right? So this is kind of the complex uh, plane. So this is real axis, imaginary axis. Or should I order them according to phase, right? Which we kind of, um, you, you might already see that this is actually what we do in the time domain somehow. So is this the right way to, to order these, these uh, eigenvalues to, to have increasing variability? Well, at, at this point, we, we don't really know, but what we defined, right, variability. We know how to, to indicate variability in, in this case. So the variability is measured by this, by this total variation. Right? So, so let's just plug in then these, these eigenvectors and then see how, what, what is the total variation. Uh, and if you work this out, right, then you see that you get kind of this expression. So it's not lambda i like we had in the, in the, in the undirected graph. So yeah, it cannot be because it should be, uh, it's an L1 norm, so it should be a positive, uh, it should be a positive value. So we get kind of this expression here. So it's a modulus of one minus the lambda i divided by this lambda max times then the, the L1 norm of the, the eigenvectors. So this one you can, you can all normalize so we, we can, we can uh, get rid of this. And then it turns out that actually what matters is the distance of your complex, uh, of your complex eigenvalue to this point in the, in the complex uh, field, which is the point on the real axis uh, that has as value uh, the, the, the magnitude of lambda max, and the imaginary value is zero. So it's the distance to this point that, that matters. So you should order them according to these blue lines here. So the, the, fir the first one that comes closer to this point is actually the, the, lowest, uh, the lowest frequency. So that's lambda one. And then you see lambda two is further away from this point, so that should be the, the, second, the second one because it has a higher variability and so on. So that's the way you should order them. So you should order them according to their distance to this point. And then you order them according to increasing variability. If you use this total variation, right? So you can consider other measures, right? Uh, that, that are intuitively making sense, but this is what, what people generally consider. So it's then a little bit different concept there. So what about time domain as a graph? Uh, yesterday, there, uh, Luisa also uh, discussed this. So can we view the time domain uh, also as kind of a special case of the, of the graph domain? Well, it turns out that the, the classical DFT matrix and this traditional frequency grid there are actually obtained by the adjacency matrix of the cycle graph. So consider this cycle graph where, uh, let's say, time index 1 points to time index 2 and that to time index 3 and so on. So then this is kind of the adjacency matrix. And if we do the eigenvalue decomposition, well, you know that this is a circle and matrix, so it gives you as, uh, so it can be diagonalized by the DFT matrix. So here we get the DFT and the DFT inverse. And these rows here, so the rows of the V inverse will be your, your let's say, frequency modes, and, and we know these are the exponentials, right? And then it turns out for, for this particular uh, circle and matrix that what we have as diagonal entries is like the, the classical frequency grid, so they are on this, on this uh, unit circle in the complex domain uniformly spaced, right? So these are actually the, the, the related graph frequencies. Usually we use as, as frequencies, right, in the time domain what is in the exponent, 
Here in, in, the, in, in graph signal processing, I mean, the, the, the exponentials themselves are considered the frequencies. And then you see also that our, our because this is directed graph, so our variability kind of makes sense, right? Because indeed it's the distance to this point here, right? That determines uh, how big the frequency is. So, so the frequency, so lambda two is indeed closer to lambda one than lambda three. So indeed uh, lambda two uh, has a higher frequency content than lambda three. And you see here also that lambda 5 is actually as close to lambda 1 as lambda 2. So actually lambda 2 and lambda 5 in terms of total variation, they have the same total variation and they have the same graph frequency. And it makes sense, right? Because, okay, they, they actually are uh, varying in the, in the same way. Of course, in classical signal processing, we, order, we don't order them. Uh, so according to my ordering that I just mentioned, we should order them lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda, and then lambda 5, and then lambda 3, and lambda 4, actually. But usually we do it then according to phase in the classical signal processing. But, but you see that our, our ordering related to the distance to this point kind of makes sense in the, in the graph signal processing context. What's also important to see is that actually any circulant graph, whether it's uh, directed or undirected, and whether you use even the adjacency or the Laplacian, because it always leads to a circulant graph shift operator, so it can always be diagonalized by the DFT matrix. So all of them. Right, lead to uh, as a graph Fourier transform, it will be the classical DFT matrix. Uh, so whether I take the adjacency matrix, for instance, of this directed graph, or I take this undirected cycle, right? Of course, the, the, the graph frequencies will be different, so they will not be uniformly distributed on this uh, unit cycle in the complex domain. So that is a bit different, but but okay, mm -hmm. I could as well represent the time domain using this graph or or this graph. Uh, some people. Uh, yeah, kind of uh, religiously stay with, with this representation of time domain. And when you develop a method in graph signal processing and it, it doesn't extend to time domain using this graph, then they say, ah, this is not a, a valid uh, approach. But I disagree with that. I, 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 I think that you should also consider these type of representations of time domain. And if your GSP method work, works, I mean, can be extended to time domain for any one of those, then, then you have a, a good method. I think. Because why would time index 1 only be connected to time index 2 and not to time index 3, right? So then it depends also on your sampling rate, apparently, uh, how you represent time as, as a graph. So uh, you should be a bit uh, careful uh, with that in general. OK, any questions so far? Yes. So on the previous slide, you showed like these uh, points around the ring as mm -hmm. the, the eigenvalues of the, of the matrix. Um, now, those correspond to the modes in the graph, and the higher variability should correspond to how far they are to the left in this case. Yeah. Is that something you can actually see when you look at those eigenmodes? Because I don't have a great imagination for this uh, without actually computing it. Uh. Yeah, and in this case, it's clear, right? In time domain, it's clear because, okay, if I plot this exponential, this exponential will be the same variability as this one, right? Because we know that these are like the negative frequency, right? And then the positive frequency, right? Oh, I or, see, okay. Right? Because we know if you take a DFT, actually, uh, the frequencies go up to the half, right? And then actually, this is like a, this is the negative part, right? That, okay, that's, that's yeah. clear. Right? So that's why lambda 2 and lambda 5 are indeed the same variability. Right? Uh, in the next slide, if you can repeat again why it's uh, like any circular graph can direct to it. Well, because a circular matrix is a pro because okay, we know a circular convolution, right, is like a product in the in the in the frequency domain, right. So that means that, uh, that, uh, that a circular matrix, which represents a circular convolution, can be diagonalized by a classical DFT matrix, because it becomes like a, uh, a, an element-wise product in the, in, the, in the Fourier domain. And then that, 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 that diagonal that you have is then the, you could say the, yeah, these are the eigen, eigenvalues of this, uh, of this decomposition. So what's the difference between the two, again, graphs? Yeah, so the, the, the eigenvectors will be the same, only the eigenvalues will be different. 
right? Because they are different circulant filters, you could say, and, and so they have different uh, frequency responses. And that the frequency response of this filter, so here it will be the filter minus one, two, minus one. And here it will be the filter one, one. So, uh, and before it was the filter, yeah, that just is a pulse. So with a pulse, we know that it's kind of a, a, a uniform uh, frequency response. That's why, that's why we have these exponentials, because the pulse is potentially shifted. Thank you. But any circular matrix, right, that's a standard property, so it can be diagonalized by the DFT matrix. That's why you should not religiously stick to the cycle graph, uh, the directed cycle, as, as to represent time, in my view. OK, so we have this frequency domain. So then we can start doing filtering, right? So uh, we saw this yesterday also. You can magnify, you can I mean, cut off certain frequencies and, and remove the noise and so on. So this is then just an element-wise product, right, in this graph uh, frequency domain. So we multiply, let's say, the, the x hat n with some kind of scalar value which will be then the, the, the frequency response, the graph frequency response of that filter. So in the end, in a, in a matrix vector notation, we multiply the, the signal in the frequency domain with the diagonal matrix. And on the diagonal is then the frequency response of your, of your filter, but in, in a graph single processing context. So if you see what this means in the, in the node domain, it, it sees, right, so it, it looks like this. So we, 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 take, we go to the frequency domain, we multiply with the diagonal matrix, and we go, we go back. So it's nothing else than a linear matrix vector product, right? A graph filter, nothing else than that. But it's a special matrix, right? So it's diagonalizable by the, the graph Fourier transform. So H cannot be any matrix. Right? So it has to satisfy this property, which you can easily prove that it then also is kind of shift invariant. So whether I first apply the filter and then the shift, or the other way around, is kind of the same. So you could say this is kind of the extension of right time invariant, uh, linear time invariant filters or systems but then to the, to the graph domain. So whether I first do a delay and then a filter, or the other way around, doesn't change. And, and these properties are kind of the same. Because you can work them out. Eh? Remember, the graph shift operator is also diagonalizable by, by V. So, um, so that's why, in the end, this is just a, becomes like a product of diagonal matrices. And then they commute, of course. And so this has many applications. Uh, we, we, we saw many yesterday. So you can do semi-supervised learning or kind of interpolation. I suppose you have a graph. You know the signal on specific nodes. And then you want to fill in the, the, the signal value on the red node. So you can do some kind of low-pass filter, basically, on the graph. Or we saw it also in image processing here. I, I, I see I, I represent it with uh, kind of a community graphs where, let's say, every community has a certain, let's say, opinion. So these could be. In a, in a Facebook network, uh, different opinions. And they're a bit noisy, and you want to de do denoising. But I want to only do denoising within the communities where we have a lot of connections. I don't want to have, let's say, blurring over these communities. The same way as in image processing, right? I, I don't want to have blurring over the, over the edges in the image. I, I, the, the smooth patches there, I want to do my denoising. But that happens automatically in a graph filter because we have many connections here. So mainly here, there will be a smoothing. And, and between communities where we have less connections, there will be less uh, mixing of signals. And you see after denoising, there's no leakage of the red color into the blue. And then later, I mean, late in the second part, I will also talk about distributed optimization and deep learning, how graph filters fit in, fit in that framework. OK, maybe now at some kind of high level, uh, high level view of, of filter design later, we will go more specifically into, into depth, into that detail. But OK, so we know that okay, we have this H matrix, and, and suppose we want to design it. But, but OK, uh, H should have this kind of specific property, so it should be diagonalizable by the graph uh, Fourier transform. So basically, then there's two kind of approaches to, to graph filter design. There's kind of a graph dependent one and a graph independent one which is also sometimes called a universal filter design. In the graph-dependent case, you kind of know the graph and you know the graph frequencies. So for instance, in a six-node graph, suppose you know lambda 1 up to lambda 6. And you say, OK, I want to design. I suppose it's an undirected graph here. So we know, uh, and it's from a Laplacian, let's say. So we know these are low frequencies, these are high frequencies. And suppose we want to design a low-pass filter, keeping only the first three and then suppressing the last three. 
So that you can do based on the knowledge of these graph frequencies. And usually you can do a very good job there. Actually, you can do a perfect job if you have. I mean, we will see later on that, that number of, if you have number of unknowns versus number of uh, equations, you can perfectly get ones there and, and zeros there with the, in, the, in the red case. The graph independent case is a little bit different. There, we don't really know the graph and the graph frequencies, but we know kind of a, a region where the graph frequencies are uh, uh, are lying. So suppose it's from, so for, for instance, for this normalized Laplacian, we know it's from 0 to 2, for instance. So then let's design, let's say, a, a graph filter, you know, in the, in the con over the continuous graph domain, like in the blue curve there. Right? And we kind of try to fit it to this kind of a uh, low pass structure. So then wh wherever the graph frequencies are, are, are positioned, we, we, we really don't care, right? Wherever they are, we, we know that, that in the end, if the, if the blue curve uh, holds, that, that they will uh, result in a low pass characteristic. Right? Of course, in that case, we cannot do a perfect fitting. We'll see later on that we cannot follow exactly the black line. Yes, there's a question in the back. But okay, so now it's maybe a bit abstract, but I will go into details later. But. Sorry, Professor. Uh, for the graph independent case, is there any way to, it's a random guess, we know it's from 0 to 2 in the case of the normalized Laplacian, but is there a way to say, for example, 90% of eigenvalues will be found here, or it's, or it's a total random guess? Yeah, so, the, so yeah, it's, it's hard to say in the outset if it's not, let's say, normalized in some way, but there are also methods, like simplified methods, like power iteration methods, for instance, that can allow you to kind of at least find the maximum in a Laplacian, for instance, you know there the, the, the minimum is zero, and you could potentially yeah, find it through kind of some distributed methods or something. But okay. okay, it would be an additional step that you need then, yes. That's Thank you. But most often, yeah, uh, you will apply this graph independent case to a normalized version of the, of the graph shift operator. What about implementation? Right, so how do I implement this h times x, right? Because, I mean, you could have uh, graphs that, that are thousands of, of nodes, so then this matrix vector uh, product might not be uh, ideal. So you could think, okay, let's do it in the frequency domain, huh? like we do in classical signal processing, because then it's just an element-wise product. The problem is that there's no fast implementations of the graph for gate transform, at least not, not in general. There are some works that actually start, uh, started looking at that for specific types of graphs. So also the graph Fourier transform is kind of a matrix vector product. So, so then, yeah, doing V minus one times X is kind of the same complexity as just directly doing H times X. So we could as well stay in the vertex domain and do H times X. And that's what we usually do. So the implementation of graph filters is very often done in the, in the node domain, but it's still highly complex, right? We still have a complexity of, of N squared where N is the number of, of nodes. So that is why people are, are often looking at parameterized filters in the vertex domain. So can we find some kind of parameterization of, of H that, uh, first of all, is eligible, so it should satisfy the shift invariant property, and, and that makes it efficient, I mean, the product of H times X. Right? And there are a few that we will look at. The, the very popular one is polynomial functions in, in S, but you can also consider rational polynomial functions of, of S. Both of them are kind of diagonalizable by the graph Fourier transform and they satisfy the shift invariant problem. So these will be kind of the extensions of FIR and IIR filters in the, from the time domain. But okay, we need to show that this parameterization is indeed more efficient, that I can then more efficiently implement H times X instead of the squared complexity, I should get a lower complexity. And maybe we can also look at whether we can distribute then the, the processing. Can we implement H times X then in a distributed way? Okay, so now we will look a little bit at these different uh, parameterizations and then also look a little bit at the design, although I will go a little bit more quickly maybe over the design. But the first one, the first the parameterization is this kind of polynomial of the graph shift operator. So in that case, the matrix H is just a polynomial in this graph shift operator, so it's weighted versions of this graph shift. And remember what happens when you look at S to some power, so you look at, at larger neighborhoods of the, of the node, of the, of the node of interest. Uh, and you can easily show, show, since S is diagonalizable by the graph Fourier transform, that H is also diagonalizable. And the frequency response is then nothing else than a polynomial in the graph frequency. So this is kind of the extension of the FIR filter. Uh, 
Uh, but instead of you know, a time delay, we have a, a graph shift. Right? So if you, if you replace this lambda n by e to the power, right, uh, j omega n, then you actually have your, your classical frequency response right, of an FIR filter. So now we have more general uh, lambda n's here. Right, so this is your standard temporal FIR filter where you have delays and you kind of do a, a weighted version of shifted signals. Now we have also kind of a weighted version of the shifted signals, but we shift with, with the graph shift operator. And note that here we directly work with the whole vector, right? So here we can do it kind of with the, with the, like in a serial uh, approach with the time streams. But it's kind of the same notion. And that's why we also call this very often a convolution, right? Uh, this is kind of the extension of a convolution uh, from the time domain to the, to the graph domain. Now, is this easier to implement than directly h times, uh, times x? Well, well, yes, it is, right? Because every time we multiply x with s, that's kind of efficient because it's a very sparse matrix. And, and we only have capital M operations. So the number of operations is equal to the number of edges, not the number of nodes squared, right? And we have to do that a number of times, though, right? So we have to multiply several times with, with s to get s to the power k times x. But OK, usually k is not very big and much smaller than the number of nodes. So complementation cost is like k times m in general. k, the order of the filter, and the number of edges. So when the degree is kind of uh, fixed, you could say that this is kind of linear in the number of nodes instead of quadratic. And it can also be uh, easily distributed, because this multiplication with Sx, actually, if you look at what, what node i has to do, it just has to talk to its neighbors, right? that, that point to him, ask, ask their signal, and then combine these signals using the corresponding edge weights for that node. So a node just has to talk to its neighbors, and then it can, it can operate this uh, s times x. So it can be efficiently done in a distributed way. Every node just has to talk capital K times to its neighbors and combine the information. Uh, first of all, with the weights, edge weights, and then with the edge case, right, with the filter coefficients. Is that, is that, I guess that's clear, right? So FIR filter, I guess that's uh, well known to many of you. How do we design it? Well, it's just kind of polynomial fitting, right? So I'll not say much about it. I'm not going to go into the, into, into, the, into the notation here. But yeah, it's like a fitting. So I, can, I have a desired response. So I do the design here in the frequency domain. I have a desired response. I have my polynomial. So I try to fit one to the other, right? Using these squares, let's say. Uh, And that can be applied right, for directed as well as uh, undirected, because these lambda n's, yeah, they can be real valued, complex valued, it doesn't matter much. I can design it in any way uh, I want. Uh, this is generally graph dependent, you could say, right? because I need to know the, the lambdas if I want to do this polynomial fitting. Right? But you can make it also graph independent. So people have also done that by just looking at kind of a grid of possible lambdas. So again, suppose that you know that the eigenvalues are between, them, between 0 and 2. I don't know where they are, but let's take, let's say, 100 of them or 1,000 of them, and I uniformly space them on the grid, and I plug those in there. And then my, I know that I have some kind of a shape that will be low pass or high pass, depending on, on what we want to do. We'll see some examples later on. So you can make this kind of least squares design also graph independent, if you want. You can also do another approach, not least squares, but kind of do a, a fitting to, to so-called orthogonal polynomials, which are, are well studied, like Chibichev polynomials or Forsyth polynomials. And these, these kind of series expansions, they are well known in, 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 in mathematics. And, and actually, these, these coefficients and the CKs, they are also kind of in, in, in closed form available. And then I just truncate that series expansion up to K, right? and I get kind of a polynomial fitting. So for Chebyshev, this is well, well, well studied also. Uh, there, usually the fitting is done over the continuous range because these Chebyshev polynomials, they are orthogonal over a continuous range. I mean, orthogonal with a certain weighting, but, but Chebyshev is very often used because we know that it has good properties even if you cut it off. Um, but these Chebyshev polynomials, they mainly focus on undirected graphs. It's not so easy to extend this to directed graphs. And, but the, the design is there graph independent. We have also been looking then at using foresight polynomials. These are actually orthogonal not over a continuous range, but over the actual 
set of uh, frequencies that, that you assume known. So in this case, we use the design will be graph dependent. But the nice thing about foresight is that you can use it also for complex uh, graph frequencies. So that can be applied for undirected as well as directed. And again, since these polynomials can be computed in a recursive way, so they're not the mon mon monomials that we had before, as lambda to some power, but they can be easily computed in a recursive way. So, so all the, the nice properties of efficient implementation and distributed implementation, they kind of hold. Uh, although they're not, let's say, monomials uh, in, the, in the graph frequency or in the graph shift operator, but uh, there are nice recursions. So I can compute uh, one polynomial from, from the, I can compute uh, one pro polynomial from the previous two polynomials. Usually it's like a relationship between three polynomials. So this is kind of a summary. So we have a number of parameters is k plus one. We have no stability issues, of course, like in, like in, in time domain, efficient distributed implementation. The cost is equal to number, the order times number of edges. Uh, we have a least squares design that is possible for directed, undirected graphs, can be dependent, independent. And we have these orthogonal polynomials where you have also different versions for directed, undirected, and graph dependent and independent. The problem is that whenever you have a response like, like in time domain, uh, if you have sharp edges in your fre desired frequency response, an FIR filter will not match them well, unless you have to take a very high order, but then the problem is very ill-conditioned. Right? So this ill-conditioning in the design is, is something that is always popping up in this FIR filter design. That's why we have been uh, studying actually autoregressive moving average graph filters. So in that case, we consider actually a rational polynomial of the graph shift operator. So which is a kind of an extension of the IIR filters that we know from, from the time domain. So in that case, we have our, our polynomial and we multiply it with an inverse polynomial in the graph shift operator. And you can show that this is still diagonalizable by the graph Fourier transform, uh, because S is diagonalizable by the graph Fourier transform. And the frequency response is now given by this uh, rational polynomial of the graph frequencies. Right? So before we only, only had the numerator, now we have also the denominator. Again, if you replace lambda n by e to the power j omega n, you get your classical, uh, your classical uh, autoregressive moving average frequency response that we know from our classes. Right? So now it's kind of looks like this. So this is what we had in time domain, right? So you have your uh, uh, moving average part and your kind of uh, autoregressive part. And so again, I can make, make a copy and replace the delay by the graph shift operator and I get like the same uh, representation. There's a little bit of a problem now because as I said before, so usually when we uh, look at a block scheme of the temporal versions, then we, have, we don't have vectors as input and output, but we have our time signals there. And so a delay, I can actually, this feedback, can, I can actually implement that. Right? So because I have my output, so I can delay it, I can, I can put it in the delay, and so I have here yt minus 1, which I computed before, so I have that available. This goes up to yt minus p, so I have that available. So these values are there. Here we have kind of a bit of a problem, right? Because, okay, here I have a vector and I have to do the graph shift, but I don't have this vector yet, because it depends a bit on, on what happens here, if I apply this directly on the vectors. So this feedback is, is, is easy to implement, but this feedback here in the, in the graph autoregressive moving average is not so easy to implement. It's not directly implementable because we work with these vectors. Although I can write this block scheme, but uh, yeah, the implementation is a bit more tricky. It cannot be directly done like this. Is that, yeah, I guess that's clear, right? So how do we do that, the implementation, right? So, okay, the moving average part is kind of, imp the same as with the FIR filter, so the Q times X is the, is the same. It's the other regressive part that makes it a little bit more tricky, but okay, I can bring the P matrix to the other side, and then, then it's basically, I basically have to solve a system of equations, where P is a polynomial in the graph shift operator. Right? So again, P has, okay, P itself might not be sparse, but it can be written as, let's say, a superposition of a polynomial, or it can be written as, let's say, a polynomial in a sparse matrix. And that's sometimes enough to kind of uh, simplify the, the solution to this kind of uh, system of equations. So you can use gradient descent, conjugate gradient descent, and so on, where very often we just have iterations where we have a multiplication with P. So whenever we do a multiplication with P, it can be efficiently implemented because P is a polynomial also in S. Uh, 
So then we have an implementation cost. So here it's Q times N, here it's then P times M, right? So the order times number of edges, but it's per iteration. So then it depends a bit also on how many iterations I need for these type of methods uh, in terms of the compl complexity. Can then this be distributed? Okay, this we know can be distributed. So how about this one? Can we kind of easily distribute that? So actually, it has been shown in this paper of 2015 that gradient descent can actually be distributed, but this conjugate gradient and quite of base methods, yeah, that's tougher to, to distribute that uh, because we have some kind of, then you, you need some kind of full consensus uh, steps uh, in, in between. Yeah, by the way, so here and there you see references uh, in, in the text itself, uh, but if I put them in the bottom, they're usually related to our literature and some others are, are will be spread out over the, over the slide. So how do we make that distributed? Well, there are, there are ways to, to do that. There are kind of uh, recursions that you can, that you can use, so, such as this kind of heat kernel uh, recursion, where I uh, compute yt plus one from yt by multiplying it with the graph shift operator. And always I add also the graph shift operator implemented or, or applied to my x. If you run this recursion, you can, you can, you can uh, easily show that, that uh, at infinity, this will lead to kind of an order one autoregressive uh, filter. So we'll get something like phi, I didn't write it here, but uh, like phi minus psi s at inverse. Right? So it will be, a, let's say, a polynomial inverse that you get, or the first order. So to get higher orders, I can do a parallel or serial implementations of these uh, heat curves. Uh, so we have uh, published this in, uh, in I guess, 2017. So there you can see more information about that. But you can also directly look, look at this equation and do a, a kind of a distributed implementation for that using, for instance, uh, yeah, well-known uh, Richardson method and, and Jacobi method, where you kind of recursively apply this kind of uh, multiplication with P uh, and the Z. Remember, the Z comes from the FIR, the moving average part. Right? So we're solving PI equal to Z. So running this or running that, and it's perfectly distributed, right? Because the multiplication with P can be distributed. Here we decompose P into the diagonal part and the off-diagonal. So again, the off-diagonal part can be distributed. Diagonal one is also easy. It's just working on the nodes themselves. So that's also fairly easy. So implementation cost again is P n times uh, per, per iteration. So you can distribute them. You can also efficiently implement them. The design is kind of polynomial, rational polynomial fitting then. Again, I'm not gonna go into details. There are many different methods. You can do a prony method, uh, there's iterative methods. So I'm not gonna go into too much details there, but it's kind of polynomial fitting. And again, you can do this for directed graph, for uh, graph dependent or graph independent. Depend, I mean, so that depends whether I plug in there the known graph frequencies or I plug in a grid, a grid of graph frequencies over a certain range where I know that my true graph frequencies are residing. Right, so the summary here is we have more parameters, right, in, in general, or yeah, not necessarily more, but we have now two polynomials. Right? There's also, in contrast to time domain, there's actually no stability issues, right? It's not that you need uh, uh, your, your poles to be uh, within the, uh, the unit circle, so that, that doesn't hold here, because actually we have all finite signals, so nothing really blows up to infinity. Uh, we only have to make sure that this matrix kind of is invertible, right? So that's what we have to make sure. There's, so there's an efficient distributed implementation. So the, the cost is kind of uh, order of magnitude uh, P times M per, per iteration because it's the, the Q1, that one doesn't hurt us too much. It's this part that, that because we have more iterations there, that is like the most important part. We can do least squares or iterative least squares design. And the nice thing is now that we have a good, we will see later on that we have a good approximation for, for low filter orders compared to the FIR filter, like, like we know from our uh, classical digital signal processing classes. The nice thing is also that when you look at many of the graph signal processing optimization problems, uh, think about Tikhonov regularization or denoising, if you work them out, they will often have a form that is that looks like this. So what people then do is to implement this, they say, okay, let's, let's fit an FIR filter to this and then we can implement uh, this kind of solution of our, of our problem to distribute it or, or whatever. 
But this approach allows you to directly implement your, your solution, right? Think about a Wiener filter, it has this kind of shape, right? It's something inverse and then your match filter, your decorrelator inverse. So many of the yeah, optimization problems that you would formulate in graph signal processing lead to a form like this. And then it makes sense to directly implement that form and not to try to approximate it with an FIR filter. So here you see some examples, a kind of simple toy example where we want to design a, uh, an ideal low pass filter. So this is uh, for an undirected graph. So as graph shift operator, we take the normalized Laplacian. Uh, we take here just, uh, I mean, there's, uh, there's not really a graph here available, so we take just a uniform grid of 100 points. So it's kind of a graph independent design, you could say. And you see that FIR filter, this is for 16, uh, for 16 taps, it's, it's kind of not doing a good fit. So you get this kind of uh, ripple effects while, while autoregressive moving average filters for the same number of uh, coefficients, they can do a much better fit. Even the one with the iterative approach, the red one, I mean, it's almost perfect. And that's the, the typical ill conditioning issue, right, that we have with FIR filter. Um, here you see the, the mean square, so the, the fitting error of these, of these curves as a function of the, of the filter order. So the FIR is here the yellow one, uh, or sorry, it's the, the green one. Also other IIR approaches that other people uh, discussed before, they are actually not doing so well, so you really need to do uh, this kind of uh, iterative approach that we discussed, so that you see in purple here. The numbers here are related to the, to the the order, because we optimize over the different over the orders of numerator and denominator, and then these values are the denominator values. Yes. Uh, orders are diff uh, the same for the two filters. Did you yes. Did yes. You, did, did you compare the number of operations? Yes. So actually, I don't have the figure here, but in, in uh, my PG students' thesis, also based on a reviewer comment, we actually also compare things for the same for the same complexity. Because I expect yeah. that, that recursive one with here will have much larger number of operations. Well, so if you do the same number of operations, what would it be the difference? Yeah. So it decreases, but it's still better. Yeah. So it was still better. Yes. Uh, so we have done that. That's a good question, actually. So here we kind of focus not on filter design. So because the number of uh, Yes, so yeah, no, no, uh, okay, yeah, I agree, yeah. So this is for the directed graph. Again, we, we don't consider a specific graph, but uh, we consider a grid. But remember now, we have, uh, we have complex frequencies, right? So now, uh, if we take the normalized adjacency matrix, actually, we know that all the graph frequencies are within the unit cycle somewhere. And we know that the low pass part, remember, it's like, it's like if we have an ideal low pass filter, it should be like a circle right, around, around this point, the, the point lambda max zero on the real axis. So this is the real axis here. So this was, let's say, so these are very low frequencies. And, and if you go further away from this point, you get higher and higher frequencies. So a low pass filter would actually be this kind of, uh, in 3D, this kind of half, half a cylinder or something. And then fitting that with an FIR filter or autoregressive moving average filter, you see also we get a much better fitting. So then, then it's even harder to do the fitting, right? Uh, because we get now, we, we are working, we have to do a fitting in a complex domain. Sorry. Excuse me. So what, what are the colors on the left, the dots, the colors, what are they indicating? Um, yeah, so the, the it's like similar to here. So in blue, we have the grid points, and then red is actually the, the shape of the, of the frequency response. So here the same. So actually here, in this bottom, the, 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 the blue points are the grid points, and red is actually the, the shape of the frequency response. So here, actually, red, right. the red on top of the blue. Right. Yeah, that's clear. And here, it's kind of the, the, the colors indicate the height again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here, we only have the red points. Yeah. Is, that, is that a bit clear? Because, okay, for this one, if to design a filter, right, in the complex domain, we kind of need to know what is, what is low frequency and high frequency in the complex domain. And then we need this kind of total variation uh, no, notion to, uh, to help us out there. Of course, you can also do data design, uh, data-driven designs, and we will come back to that later on when we look at uh, extensions of this. Uh, 
yeah, this is again the, the filter design, again for the same order, not the implementation complexity compared to FIR with, with what we do. Um, but you see that FIR, yeah, it doesn't really improve, right? Because it's so ill-conditioned, so it doesn't do a good job. Um, these are also, this is now then graph dependent, so now we consider then an Eddos Rainey graph with a certain edge probability, 100 nodes. So now we consider the actual graph frequencies and we do the design for that. So then again, we get the kind of the same <coughs> result. Here we also compared the, the JBCHEF and the, the foresight. So because you see that the least squares, in that case, uh, for these graph dependent designs, uh, sometimes yeah, uh, also blows up at, at higher orders. So that's why these orthogonal polynomials, because you, you might wonder, okay, why do we need these orthogonal polynomials? Well, they, they are often uh, yeah, give us kind of robustness, so, because then the design is much easier. Because the least squares design yeah, still suffers from, from these uh, kind of uh, uh, ill condition. <coughs> This is then filter implementation results, so not the design. So we've done the design, now we look at the implementation and we look at the output, the error for, for the output. Uh, this is again a graph, graph independent uh, design that we did on 100 grid points, but then we run it on an actual Eddos Rainey graph, right? So we, we take one of these, this was a, a, an undirected graph, so we take one of these filters that we designed before on a uniform grid, so I don't know the graph, but then I apply the filter to, uh, to an actual graph. Uh, and we try to see how close we are in the, so it's like a wide input and uh, we try to fit the output after t iterations to the, the desired output, to the expected output. And then the, these are these kind of iterative methods, so you see Richardson method for, for different w's, for different weights, and Jacobi method, so, so they have different performances, usually Jacobi is kind of better than, than Richardson, uh, especially if you look at the optimal weights. Uh, this is the same then, but for a directed graph. So this was an Abdos Rainey undirected graph, which <coughs> then for a directed graph. So kind of the same conclusion. So then for sure Jacobi is kind of better. So these recursions also hold for directed and, and undirected graphs. Okay, so is that clear? Any questions on that? So that's kind of graph filters. So we looked at two versions. Later on we will we'll, after the break we will look at some extensions. Uh, but okay, let me, before, the, before we go to the coffee break, say a little bit about time-varying data on graphs. Like in all these examples that I showed uh, before, uh, in the very beginning, we saw time series right on the nodes. But, but in, in what we saw just now, we considered a single scalar because that's then working in the graph domain. So we only consider a signal over the graph domain. But now we have different uh, time series there. Uh, so we have kind of a graph dependency of the data and a temporal dependency, right? So how do we jointly kind of consider that? Uh, so we have time series right over the different nodes. And, and this is, of course, more applications even than what we considered before. So because that's what you generally have and you want to maybe predict future values, you want to interpolate graph time signals, detect certain anomalous patterns and, and so on, or classify them. Uh, because this could be, the nodes could be, let's say, from a skeleton, and, there's a, and, and the signal is, like say, the position of the skeleton, and then you want to detect whether that person falls or not. So there's many yeah, uh, different applications. So but how do we then jointly exploit this kind of graph time coupling? Right? So the naive approach is that you just consider it separately. Right? So I stack everything in a matrix, and the, let's say the columns are the, the graph signals, the rows are the time signals, and I just process column by column and then row by row or the other way around, right? So it's kind of very separate and that has, of course, uh, advantages because you can use the traditional tools. We know how to do this now for graph signals. Uh, we know also how to do this for time signals. So it's easy. We can do theoretical analysis also based on that. But it doesn't capture kind of these joint dependencies uh, between the two, right? And we, we don't get that additional gain from this kind of joint dependency. So there's then kind of two uh, uh, ways that people have approached this. One is through graph recursive models. So you, I will go into more details in a, in a, in a minute. But you kind of uh, write down kind of an, an autoregressive uh, filter. Now it's autoregressive in time. So remember, we had an autoregressive filter that, that we just discussed, or autoregressive moving average. But that was purely in the graph domain. 
Now it's kind of an autoregressive recursion that we get uh, purely, sorry, in the graph domain. Now we get an autoregressive recursion in the time domain. So I express my current time signal as a, as a linear combination of previous time signals. And I will put, let's say, the, the way that I, that I uh, weigh them will be by graph filters, FIR graph filters here. But they could by, by themselves be autoregressive graph filters even. So then we have autoregressive auto form in, in time and, and, and the graph domain. The other way to, that is maybe even simpler to conceive is just to join the two graphs, right? So we have, we have our graph, and we know that time domain can also be represented in a graph. Here I don't consider a circle. So it's just a, I consider this kind of a linear graph here that is not cut short. It's also a way that you could represent time. And I kind of joined them using a so-called product graph. And there's many versions. We'll look a few, at a few of them. And then, OK, then I'm in business, right? Because I know how to, how to do graph signal processing now. So I can use any of the, of the traditional uh, uh, graph filters that I've just discussed. And then look at the, whole, the signal on this whole graph to, to process it using a graph filter on the whole graph. Well, this is, of course, a little bit more complex because the graph really blows up here, right? So, so very often we, we've been working on, on these type of models. There's a way also that you can actually find a link between the two representations for some specific product graphs, but I will not go into details. So these with graph recursive models look a bit like this. So, so this is your standard, right, autoaggressive uh, model for, for scalar time series. Uh, so you press XT as a linear combination of, of past signals. Uh, and you have some uncertainty. And you can, of course, extend this to vectors. So you get kind of a vector autoregressive model if you have multiple uh, scalar time series. So then I look at my current vector as a linear combination of past vectors. And we get this kind of uh, combining weights, which are now matrices, right? So they are n by n matrices. So we have a lot of more parameters, of course, in this vector autoregressive model than in a classical one. I could consider also parallel autoregressive models for every one of the series. But but then, of course, I don't have the coupling between the, the different ones. And here, of course, HP is kind of the weight that connects time index T with T minus P. Here you have, let's say, all these different matrices and their entries. So if we look at entry MN, it kind of connects at time T, node M, with at time T minus P, node, node N. Right? So P is kind of the delay in time, and MN is then the, the connection between the nodes. And you could say, okay, this is already enough, right? So you could say, okay, this already uh, can help us out because, okay, HP could be, I mean, from our graph, I could conceive certain uh, HPs uh, because, yeah, you could consider maybe I have a different graph for yeah, linking these different time indices, right? And, and then I can plug in these graphs and, and then I can restrict myself to this one. Uh, but what we try to do actually is now to bring in explicitly the structure of the graph into this form also to reduce the number of uh, parameters that we have in general. So then we come to this kind of uh, graph uh, vector autoregressive model, where every kind of coefficient matrix that we have in the vector autoregressive model, we replace by a graph filter. And it could be uh, an FIR graph filter, like I say here, but it could also be uh, yeah, any other graph filter. Right? It could be even an autoregressive one itself. So in that case, as I mentioned, so we have then autoregressive in the graph and, and in time. So now these weights, if we look at the weight HKP, it will connect basically time instant T with T minus P. So P is the delay, but indicate hop, right? So indicate neighborhood, you could say. So it's not between explicitly between nodes anymore, but between neighborhoods, you could say, for certain neighborhoods. So that, that reduces the number of parameters a lot. So we had P times N squared. So N is the number of nodes. P is the order of the autoregression. So we have n squared, right, in the, the vector autoregressive. Now we have only p times k plus 1. So p is kind of, you could say, the reach, the order in time. And k is kind of the, the, the reach that we have over the graph domain. So you have kind of these two reaches in a way. So we go two, two steps back in time. And for every one of these time steps, we look at a certain region. There's also work that also consider actually a linear component that also includes in the sum also here that also looks at neighborhoods of XT itself, right? which is then related to the structural equation models. And, and then you actually get this structural, they call it structural vector autoregressive model. So that, that could also be even included if you want, that you also look at, at the neighborhood here. But 
But in a standard graph factor of the regressive model, we don't do that. And you can stack things then in this kind of uh, matrix vector form. So I can stack all these past signals in a matrix, and I can then write it like this. So these HKPs, I can group them, and I can bring them in the other side, so it's a little bit more simpler. And then you see that you kind of have this joint filtering, right? So I have this graph dimension where I do my, my shift operations, and I have this temporal dimension here over the columns where I do a linear combining, and, and that leads to your filter. So you kind of get temporal filtering of the different nodes, and you get kind of graph filtering of the different signals, and kind of jointly. And of course, you can then design, you can uh, minimize this kind of empirical loss based on the coefficients uh, with some kind of regularizer if you want, and you can do this for the different uh, types of recursions. Uh, so you can do it for your vector autoaggressive with a lot of parameters, or your graph one with less parameters. Which then can also be done uh, in a distributed and efficient way, because we know that these multiplications, they are easy to implement. So we apply this to this kind of uh, weather stations graph of, of uh, Britannia there of Brest, around Brest, so uh, where you have where we consider the 10 nearest neighbor graph of the sensor network. So we have weather stations. So here we consider indeed these distances, or in an exponential form, as as kind of uh, the, the adjacency matrix. We have these temperature measurements, and we look at uh, let's say a time reach of order two. So we go two steps back and we look at four hop uh, neighborhoods. And then, uh, yeah, there's lots of uh, results here in these, in these curves. So this comes uh, from uh, a journal paper that was on one of the earlier slides. But uh, so the graph, uh, the, the graph violates actually the orange line that, that performs here very well. So it does better actually than the, than the vector autoregressive model, which is some, somewhere here in the, in the yellowish uh, line. Uh, because, OK, there's not enough training data to train. I mean, there is enough, but OK. Uh, if we had more training data, at some point, the vector of aggressive should be better, right? Because it's more expressive in some way. But it depends a bit then on the number of training samples that you have. So for these, uh, the 744 temperature, hourly temperature measurements we had, we, we, I mean, the fit of the, the graph vector of aggressive model was, was better. And these are steps, so that's how much you look ahead, right, in the prediction. So the, you, so far, we only considered like one step ahead of the regressive, but I could look uh, more steps ahead. Quickly, something about product graphs then. Uh, so then the question is, okay, we have time, we have the graphs, so how do we combine them into uh, one bigger graph, right? Um, so we have the time graph, which could be a line, and your spatial graph. Uh, so what you could do is you could, okay, repeat the graph for the different time instances, remove L edges, and then we look for a way now to combine things, right? That's actually what we try to do. A popular one is the Kronecker product graph, where we just consider the Kronecker product between the two graph shift operators. So the graph shift operator of the, the time domain is simple, this delay. So this means that I put actually the original graph shift operator, I put it here in the overall graph. So that means I only get links here between, between neighbors at previous time instances. Right? So a node is con not connected to its neighbors in the same time instance, but also not connected to itself in a previous time instance. So it's maybe not. Yeah, the best, maybe not what you want, but okay, it depends a bit on the application. So people have also, yeah, if you look at then what happens to a signal shift, then you see that you only combine information, right, so from your neighbors in, in the previous time instance. So then a Cartesian product graph is, is used uh, quite more often, so that's the superposition of these two Kronecker products. So if you look at, at the structure here, so we have your graph shift operator that just repeats, so we, we keep the original graphs that we had on the on the three time instances, and we just also connect the time instances. That's what the Cartesian product is doing. So here we have identity matrices that just connect the nodes uh, in the different time instances. But here the, the node is then not connected to its neighbors in other time instances, right? And then of course you can, yeah, so here you see what happens with the shift. But you can combine then the two, and that's then the strong product graph, right? which contains all these parameters. Right, that looks a bit like this, so it's a superposition of the two. Sometimes we don't know which one to use, so we have this idea of, of considering kind of a parametric form. So let's just consider all these different terms that we have, even self loops, with some kind of weighting, right? So we get this kind of general parametric form of my product graph, because, okay, in many applications, yeah, we, we don't know which one to use. Uh, 
And that means we can learn these kind of weighting coefficients. They can be binary, but they don't have to be binary. Um, and once we kind of know what is then, so we can jointly learn them from the data with the filter coefficients if we want. And then we kind of also have some information of what is a good product graph, and that could give us also a useful information in some applications. So here you can see if we do an FLR filter, for instance, on this parametric form, what, what this leads to. So we can jointly, if we want, we can jointly like, uh, estimate those. We can even combine those and, and look at another form, a more general form of a graph type filter, but I'm not going to go into details here. Yeah, I'm going to skip this a bit. Of course, we have a lot of nodes now, right? So it becomes a bit complex, so the number of edges that we have now in the product graph is usually the number of nodes from the, is, is proportional to the number of nodes of your original graph and the number of time points. So it's a, it's a large number of nodes that we have. Now. But of course, the complexity of the filters is linear in that number, not quadratic. So that helps us out a bit. Okay, so that concludes this, this first part. So I've, uh, I hope I, I kind of introduced you to this field of graph signal processing where, where you have data points that uh, can be viewed as signals on top of uh, graphs. And I've shown you notions of signal variability leading to this graph Fourier transform, which then leads to graph filtering as well. Uh, I've shown different versions of graph filters and then also how we can extend this ID to graph time signal processing. And then in the second part after the break, we will see how we can use these graph filters in distributed optimization and, and kind of machine learning uh, tools. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Loss, from your interesting presentations. Questions from the audience, please. Questions yeah, during the presentation. Yeah, right. okay. Just one question. Uh, you said that it is very important that orthogonal uh, polynomials are used for the approximation of unknown graphs. Why it is also important that they are of mini, min max, that they uh, have min max property? Because all that polynomials should be shared up of min max polynomials. Um, yeah, so I think one of the reasons is I think when you cut them, right, so then you, you have still a good performance, right? Like at JBCHF, right, when you only consider a limited series, I mean, there's some... Yeah, because we don't know reps. where the positions are, and min-max polynomials have the property to have minimal deviation, uh, right. minimal possible deviation from right. the desired property. Right. So, it's so not we, average, when we don't right. know the positions, then that property is crucial, that they do not deviate mm -hmm. much. Right. But yeah, it doesn't, I mean, we paint them because they have recurs they have these recursive properties, right? These are total polynomials. And then of course, yeah, it's important that when you truncate them, that they still have they, they kind of not, useful property and not, from right? Because right. you could say, okay, maybe I throw out, right? So the, the polynomials that follow in the higher orders, they might have, they might be important, then all of a sudden I, I remove them. But then for all these kind of orthogonal polynomials, we know that this, this still is, uh, leads to a good, good fitting. And we did actually these four sides, so because, okay, the JBCHAV is good for, let's say, uh, to have a universal filter, but it doesn't extend to directed graphs as far as I know, or not easily. So that's why we looked at this graph-dependent one, the four side, which you can then use for directed graphs uh, to improve the conditioning of the design. 